Good morning, Victory. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for tuning in to today's worship service. We are excited. Guess who's preaching today? Our own Jim Parsons is preaching today. He's going to bring a powerful message as part of our Stepping Up series. And so you're going to love it, and I'm excited that you get to hear it today. Now, a couple of things as we get started. I want to, uh, well, of course, welcome everybody. Thank you for tuning in, and I want to say that as you participate today, it's for you to participate. Um, church is never or was never meant to be something that you just watch, like what we're doing during this season. You're watching it on a screen, but it's always meant to be something you participate in. You're part of the church, and you get to be an active participant in the church. And so we welcome you during these next few minutes of this, uh, this worship service to worship with us, to lift your hands, to say amen, to participate in the group chat on, on, the, on the page with, while it's going on too if you're tuning in live. If you're not tuning, on, tuning in live, there's no one to chat with, but send us a note in the comment, leave a comment. So I want to read a scripture to get us started, and this is from the book of 2 Corinthians, and it says this. Check this out. This is powerful. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. So there's this great light that shines in our hearts, and the, 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 the shining light is God's love. And, and we're these broken vessels, these, these fragile jars of clay, and, and, and yet we hold this, this amazing gift of God's love shining within us. And, and it's clear that because we're broken, that, that the power we have comes from God. And I want to encourage you, whatever's going on in your life, God wants to empower you. God wants to lift you up and strengthen you for today and for this week and for what's going on in your life. So stand strong and trust in God. Ask for his power to shine through you, and you're going to be all right. You're going to make it. So we want to invite everyone to participate in our, on our, uh, our social media uh, Victory Anaheim at Victory Anaheim and at Lanto David through Facebook and Instagram. Stay connected with us and let us know how you're doing. We're trying to put out content that encourages you, that, that gives you just a little, a little boost to, to say, you know what, I'm going to live for God in this moment or I needed that reminder today. And so stay connected with us and leave a comment and, and like and subscribe. And then we also want to invite you to our online groups online groups, if you'd like to participate in one of our online groups, send us an email. Online groups are really important because Christianity is not a solo sport. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. This is the family of God, and we invite you to be part of a group that you can participate. Right now, we're doing all of our groups are online, and we look forward to when our groups are in person again. But for now, our groups are online, and so we invite you to send us an email at info at victoryanheim.org, and we can get you connected with one of our online groups. Well, who's ready to worship? Are you? Are you? Are you? Ready? Here we go. We're going to worship and join with the worship team as they're all ready to go. Look at all the Taginots here and plus Connor and Jock. You're like an, an, an unofficial Taginot, right? You're kind of adopted into the family. <laughs> Will you worship with us right now? Breathless in awe and wonder, 
the King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is a failing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done. chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shine like the sun in and all its brilliant the king of glory the king above all amazing grace this is a failing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that I would be set free sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy is a king who conquered the grave. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me.
Amen. Thank you for that worship team. That was beautiful. So at this time in our service, we want to invite you to, to give. And as we do that, I want to remind us that when we follow God, the longer you follow God or even when you're beginning to follow Jesus, you find that there are barriers that keep you from living the Christian life. You find that there are things that are in the way of, of you making God a priority in your life. And, 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 and you have these conflicts in, that, that arise in your life. And, and you sort of have to identify what those things are and shed some baggage. You have to knock down some walls in order to put God first in your life. And giving is one of the things that we practice as Christians as, as an act of our trust in God. We trust God with one of the things that's most near and most dear to us. And that's, that's our wallet, our checkbook, our bank account. And saying, Lord, I want to say I love you by giving. And so at, at Victory, we practice what's called the tithe. And it's 10% of, 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 our, of our income. And we say, Lord, we want to give back that 10% to you. We want to knock down the barrier that keeps us from trusting you. And, and so um, you can knock down that barrier by trusting God with giving. And so we invite you to use our online giving platform at victoryanaheim.org. Click on the tab that says online giving. And it's a secure platform that you can do both your once one-time gift or if, you're, if you want to practice like I do the, the, the weekly and just set it up so it's automated. Either way, you find that giving is a powerful way to show that you love God and show that you trust God. And when you trust God, it knocks down one of the barriers to faith. So God bless you as you knock down barriers in your life.
drawing me in as the depths of more lay before you again over and over and over again i am bringing more to you with open hands closer and closer you're drawing me in as the depths of more lay before you you deserve every piece of my heart, every piece of my heart, every piece of my heart. Come and tear down the walls I built, every wall I built, every wall I built of. Cause you deserve every piece of my heart, every piece of my heart, every piece of my heart. Hello, everyone. I am Mr. Parsons, or Jim, for most of you. I hope you're all doing well this morning, Sunday morning. And I am continuing the series, uh, Stepping Up series. And just the thought of stepping up, it's like, okay, you know, we need an army because we are at war. And it's like, okay, who's willing to step up and volunteer to fight the good fight? To be a warrior in this battle? Step up. And this message today is about parenting. And you might think, oh, I'm not a parent, so it doesn't, doesn't apply to me. It does apply to you. Because we all are involved in parenting. Young and old. Because what is parenting? It's bringing up the next generation, isn't it? And it's bringing up the next generation so that they can carry on the good fight, the faith. It's probably the most important thing that Christians have to do. Today's verse, Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now we live in a world where truth is fuzzy. It's gray. There's no absolutes. People are, they don't have this, any conviction. In fact, it's a world where each person can have their own truth. You can have your own truth. And that's okay with everyone. Except if your truth excludes their truth then that's a problem. Let me explain. See, if I want to believe that I'm a turtle, then that's okay. As long as I don't insist that you also are a turtle. Nor should you insist that I'm not a turtle. In other words, if I say I'm a turtle, you've got to go along with it. See, it doesn't matter what's real. It only matters what you res that you respect each other's beliefs, and not only that, that you go along with their beliefs. That's the world we live in today. A world where truth is whatever you want it to be. Whatever you want it to be, it can be true. But only for yourself. See, truth is always up for debate now, isn't it? You see, one person's truth steps on another person's truth. Well, you know, it's, that's the truth for them. It's not the truth for me, so we're okay with that. So as a Christian, as a Bible believer, you believe the Bible, you can't say Jesus died for your sins to anyone else. It's offensive. Because after all, they might believe they're a turtle. 
You never know. It's my understanding that truth is not fuzzy. It's not gray. There are absolutes. I mean, isn't that what the word truth means? Know this, that what you believe, what you believe in your heart, has no impact at all on what is actually true. If I say it's raining outside, and you say, I don't believe it, guess what? If we both go outside, we're both going to get wet. It doesn't matter what you believe. Unless, of course, one of us is covered by the grace of an umbrella. Now, if you say Jesus saves, and I say, well, that's nice, but I believe in Buddha. Guess what? We will both face the same God after we die. That's truth. You can say, well, I don't believe it, or you don't have proof, but ultimately, truth is truth is truth, and you can't change the truth, and that's the way it is. Did Jesus die for your sins? Does Jesus save? Is Jesus the only way? You see, it's a yes or it's a no. There's no like, eh, it could be for you, but not for me. It's not up for debate. And like the rain falling, judgment will also fall. Question, are you covered by the grace of Jesus? You know, we talk about training up a child. We have to talk about this word called philosophy. You see, the word philosophy means love of truth. When you tell me when you tell me what your philosophy is on a matter, you are telling me what you believe to be true. You may not know it, but your philosophy will always determine your actions. We often use the term Christian philosophy. So what are we referring to? Well, here it's a belief that what is true aligns with the Christian faith. What we believe to be true aligns with the Christian faith. But you only need to look at a person's actions or his behavior or his activities to know their true philosophy. It's not about their words because you can talk all, your day, all day about you know, what you believe to be true, but what you actually believe comes out in the way you act. And that's always the truth. So my call today, my call to you today, is that you step up. Step up. Start acting like what you say you believe. Does that make sense? Be a person who lives your life on a philosophy that is Christian in all areas of life. Church, work, family, school, entertainment, all areas. Now, this stepping up and doing what is right is so important. It's probably the most important when it comes to parenting, to raising up the next generation. Why? Because if we do not take a Christian approach to parenting, our Christian faith will be lost in less than two generations. Think about that. You know, you're a Christian how do you become a Christian? Someone told you. Someone lived out their life in a way that compelled you to believe. You see, if we don't continue to do that and do it in a manner that's convincing and in a manner that's like on fire, we can't have this lukewarm, oh yeah, I'm, I kind of believe it. You know, you should try Christianity. It's kind of cool, you know. Uh, that's not going to cut it. I think we live in a world today where people aren't really drawn to Christianity as much as we really want them to be. Why is that? Now, if you're not a parent, now don't tune me out. As I go through this parenting, this training up a child, don't tune me out. There's a lot here for you too. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever taken 
a world history course in school. Now, in that course, did your teacher start with Adam and Eve in the garden? No. No? Why? You mean to tell me that when you took world history, your teacher left out the first man and woman in all the world, the father and mother of all humanity. You mean your teacher left that out of a world history course? I mean, world history, isn't that supposed to be like the history of the world? Don't you start with Adam and Eve? What happened? Now, to me, that'd be a very big thing not to include Adam and Eve in a lesson on world history. How many of you took earth science in school? Did your teacher mention the creator? The one who made all these things that you're studying? How could it be that they're teaching on earth science and they fail to mention the one who made all that stuff? It's like, you know, if you're going to uh, study electric cars and don't even mention Elon Musk, whatever his name, that's his name. You don't even mention him, right? Why? Uh, that'd be kind of a big mistake, right? Well, if you're going to talk about the mountains and the oceans and the earth and everything and fail to mention the creator, the one who made it all, that's a problem, I think. What about poetry? Did you ever take a poetry class? Literature? Did your teacher, teacher use some of the best poems ever written from the, from the book of Psalms? Yeah. What's going on? You see, unless you have a Christian philosophy, unless you have a Christian philosophy, you will have a non-Christian philosophy, one where God and the Bible are excluded. What about math? You go, oh, math, you can't like, I mean, that's not Christian or non-Christian. That's, 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 that's like you know, agnostic. It's like whatever. You know, math is math, right? You might think that math is neutral, that Christians and non-Christians have the same view of math. How can math be Christian? Well, did you know that God is perfect? God is perfect. Math is a reflection of His nature. We can know what is right and what is wrong in math. And when you get the right answer, you are acknowledging a perfect God. Not only is God perfect, but His laws are perfect. From electricity, to plumbing, to gravity, all these things. Without math, none of it would work. We can launch a rocket from Earth to Mars. That is exactly like shooting a basketball from a moving truck across the Pacific Ocean and getting nothing but net on a cruise ship. Can you do that? We've done that by shooting a rocket to Mars and landing it. They get one decimal point off, guess what? They missed the planet by a million miles. Rocket science is cool. When you're a Christian, rocket science is awesome because you know that God is perfect. His creation is perfect, and everything in it is perfectly held together. By Him, all things consist. So we come to this proverb in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 22. It's a proverb. It's not really a promise. We look at it, and oh, it sounds like a promise. But it's not a proverb of promise. You see, there's no guarantees in raising children. There's no magic formula that says A plus B equals C when it comes to raising children. Why? Because we're all human. Each child is human. And each child is given a free will. And they will choose whether they will walk with the Lord or they will not. Ultimately, they will choose. And oftentimes, we're heartbroken because our children don't choose to follow the faith that we've modeled and taught them. Proverbs 22.6 is not a promise, but it is a proverb of probability. In other words, 
It's a wise saying. You see, that's what Proverbs are. They're wise sayings. Solomon's wisdom is that if we do all we can to raise our children, to raise this generation in the Christian faith, the probability, the likelihood, is that they will remain in the faith once they grow older. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The great object in parenting is to help our children choose the right way in life, to help them develop a Christian philosophy, a love of truth. The Bible teaches us that there are two ways each of us can go. Two ways. The way of the world and the way of God. Our job as parents is to help our children choose the right way which is the way of God. Now, if they go the way of the world, see, one of the mistakes many parents make is to underestimate the influence that the world has upon our children. Really. I mean, the influence is great. Experts believe that the average child is exposed to 50-some hours of TV every week or some other entertainment media. And it's probably more than that with cell phones and social media. In addition, the average child spends another 30 hours a week with friends and peers apart from their parents. That's right. Many who aren't Christians compare that to less than, what, two hours a week in church? 100 hours a year in church? If they go to church twice a week or once a week? If that's the only thing they get, you know, you go home and, hey, it's time to go to church on Sunday. Go to church, go home. Hey, how was Sunday school? It was great. And that then the rest of the week, their brains are being filled with a non-Christian philosophy over and over again. And not blatantly sometimes, it's subtle. Like failing to mention Adam and Eve when they talk about world history. That's right. The Bible says there's a way which seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. You see, the wrong way is the wrong way. It's not another way. You have to choose the way of God according to the way of wisdom. There is a way of the world and there is a way of God. God's way is the wise way. It's the way of wisdom. Proverbs 4.11, I have taught thee in the way of wisdom, the proverb says, another wise point. I have led thee in the right paths. The goal of every parent is to help their child understand and embrace God's wisdom. But how do we do that? How do we raise a child according to God's way? Well, according to the way of the child is another way to look at it. You know, when we look at this verse, train up a child in the way he should go, the word the way is obviously God's way, right? Yes. The way he should go. Right. But there's an interesting angle that someone came up with, and they thought, you know what? Every child's different. There's no blueprint to raising a child. Train up a child in the way he should go, in the way that child should be trained up. You know, some, ch- some children... Need, a, need different uh, activities, different uh, influences, different uh, teachings, different corrections. You know, each child is different. And Chuck Swindoll writes in one of his books, we receive our children from the hand of God, not as soft, pliable lumps of clay ready to be molded into what we think they should become. Each child with a set of abilities, intellectual capacity, and a way of perceiving and thinking, each child, all of which were endowed by God. All of these abilities and all of these differences. See, God didn't make any one of us the same. He made us all different. And so train up a child in the way he should go. God will give you the wisdom to train up your children. But know this, that a child has two directions or two angles or two bents, they call them. 
That's what Chuck Swindoll says in his. A bent towards good. In other words, there's some good in every child. And there's also a bent towards bad. There's some bad in every child. They're not born perfect. But they are born with a great deal of innocence. Small children have a natural hunger for the things of God. You know that? They do. They love new things. They love to read the Bible. They like to learn about God, Bible stories, hear about Jesus. That's why a lot of Sunday schools, a lot of younger kids, they're all wanting to go to church and do Sunday school, but when they become teenagers, it's like, ah, they gotta, I'd rather sleep in, right? That's because they're starting to eh, bend towards this other side. As parents, we need to do all we can to cultivate that good from their young age that is in their hearts as long as we can. How do we cultivate the good? For back to our passage of Scripture. It says, train up, train up. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The phrase train up has a rich meaning. It could mean, it could mean to train. It could mean to dedicate or to inaugurate. Probably the best definition is to stimulate. The root word in the Hebrew for uh, train up is the uh, same root word for pallet. It was sometimes used to describe the process of a nursemaid rubbing some crushed dates on the roof of a child's mouth in order to stimulate their taste buds. Train up. It comes from the same root word. So this idea of stimulate, get them to move in the right direction. Yeah. We can't force feed biblical principles to our children. We must stimulate their taste. How does a parent do this? Well, there are ways. First, making it real and practical. Deuteronomy 6 says that we should talk of it as we go through our daily routines. You see, if talking about the ways of God is natural for you, and they see you do that, then it will become natural for them. We should look for opportunities to, to discuss God's wisdom with our children and to weave it into the fabric of their lives. Some of the greatest scientists have a testimony like this. The reason I'm a scientist is because my mother or my father instilled in me a love of the creation. And when they were little, they would look at things like bugs and flowers and things of nature and things around them. And their parents would say, look how great God is. When you look at something under a microscope, microscope amazing. Look how great God is. And you've got to say that. You know, gone are the teachers that say that. We need more parents and teachers. And in this day when we're having this coronavirus and everyone's stuck at home, man, is this opportunity to step up as a parent and start to share and to open up and to say, look how great God is. And give them the stimulation that they would like to know more about who their creator is. Secondly, by modeling it before them. Perhaps the, most, perhaps the most powerful thing that we can do is model biblical principles before our children. Can't guarantee you that if you live out God's word before your children that they'll always buy into it and follow. But I can about guarantee you that if you don't model it, they won't. You see, you've got to do everything you can. You see, we're at war. You need to step up. Children are also born with a bent towards good, but they're, unfortunately they're also a bent, born with a bent towards uh, evil, towards bad. Why? Because everyone is born with a sin nature. Everyone is born with a sin nature. Where'd that come from? How come we're born with a sin nature? Where'd that come from? Romans 5.19 says, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Who's that one man? Who, who disobeyed that so everybody became a sinner? Well, who's the first man? Adam. Do you know that when Adam disobeyed, you disobeyed? That's right. Why? Because you were in Adam. You go, well, I was, okay. you were in him. 
And the Bible says that. Sin is passed to all people because of that. And so we have this nature within our hearts to do things that are selfish, that promote just ourselves. And for some, that's amplified. And for, and for even some others, it's even worse. So much so that they'll go and hurt other people just for selfish gain. The evil is there. Proverbs 22.15 says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it from him. Another translation says, Foolishness or foolish ways are deep-seated in the heart of a child. See, the word foolishness can, can mean folly or mischievous, mischiev mischievousness. Some people say mischievousness. That's not how you pronounce it. It's mischievousness. Correction there. It can also refer to one who is quarrelsome, argumentative, one who despises wisdom. Though a child is born with a great deal of innocence, it doesn't take them long to learn how to sin. The Bible says that if a child is left to themselves, they will eventually bring shame to their family. Every child must come to some point, to the point of receiving Christ as their personal Savior and then be disciplined or discipled in the ways of God. Now, Paul the Apostle, he says there's two ways to discipline a, disciplining a child in the things of the Lord, instruction and correction. Instruction and correction. We need to constantly think about how to instruct. Don't leave that one out. Not always about correction. You know, some of us are abusive in the way we correct. We're never instructing them. We're always following them around, trying to catch them in things that they don't know is wrong. You've got to teach them the right way and tell them, that there are consequences. Ephesians 4, 6 says, And fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You have to instruct them, right? The word admonition means instruction. It refers to instilling something in the mind. Each and every day we should look for ways to instill God's wisdom in our child's heart. And correction. Instruction is good, but instruction alone is not enough. There also needs to be correction. The word nurture refers to the whole instruction of a child, which sometimes includes chastening or discipline. Again, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. What's this rod of correction? Uh-oh, we're talking about spanking? Well, hold on a minute. There are a variety of opinions concerning the physical discipline of children. Some believe it, and others don't. Regardless of which way we lean, we must realize that Proverbs 22.15 deals with something much deeper than just spanking, right? The word rod is sometimes translated as a scepter, and other times as a staff. It's a symbol of authority. The rod Solomon refers to could mean an actual paddle, or it could be a reference to the parent's authority his responsibility. Discipline is a way of protecting our children from the dangers of life. The rod is also a symbol of correction. Many uh, people think that, you know, it's, it's important to spank. And if we don't spank, we should never be with, you know. The truth is, if you, if you do believe in spanking, you should never use your hand. Why? Some people believe that. Some people say, oh, you should never use your hand. Why? Because the hand is a symbol of love. It's the parent's symbol of love. It's for hugging. It's for teaching your child that you love them. So what's this rod or paddle sometimes? It's a symbol of correction. And you should never use the rod of correction first without praying with your child before and after, you know. My daughter had this little, tiny, little wooden spoon. And uh, that was the rod of correction. <laughs> it was cute. But you know what? It's like those kids were like, you're going to get the spoon. No, I don't want the spoon. You know, it didn't hurt. But it was something that was a symbol of correction, right? 
How you choose to discipline your child is between you and God. However, as parents, we must understand this. Every child needs discipline in order to properly develop. Interestingly enough, the word discipline and disciple have the same origin. Discipline conducted in the proper way is part of the process of discipling. Consider these words from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12, 5 says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children, my son. Despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. God is not an abusive parent. We can agree with that. But neither is he a permissive parent. God does what every godly parent should do. God disciplines his children in order to correct them and to produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness. As we come to the end, let me point out something very important here. The great difference between correction and punishment. Some parents punish their children with very little positive results. They yell and they scream for every little thing. Then they paddle them so much that it becomes a game. Chuck Swindoll writes, Too often I'll see a mom or dad lean down and say in a stern voice, I told you not to do that. Swat. The blow doesn't come as a lesson, but as a punctuation mark, as an impulsive, rash, purposeless, often brutal, and only teaches a child to fear the parent. The rod is a tool that has a specific purpose, and it requires a proper technique. If I could add anything, that would be this. Abuse, whether it's physical, verbal, or emotional, will not only cause your child to fear you, it will also cause the child to tune you out. There are a lot of creative ways to get the message across to our children without abusing them. The biblical reason for discipline is to help our children learn a valuable lesson. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Children must be taught to take ownership for their decisions. They cannot go through life always being the victim. They must learn that if they make good decisions, they will reap good reward. And if they make bad decisions, they will reap bad reward. Learning that one lesson can help change a person's life too many adults have never learned it. And we can see that in our society today. Successful parents or successful biblical parenting requires us to step up as parents. Now here are six things that you can write down. One, diligently teach our children biblical truth. Two, model biblical truth before them. Three, integrate biblical truth into their daily lives. They got to have it every, every day. You can't just have it on Sunday. Help our children become personally involved in serving Christ. You got to be creative. Continuously offer fervent and often heartbreaking prayer for your child's spiritual well being. Then, Number six, shield them from negative outside influences. You know, there are no guarantees. No guarantees in parenting, yet there are some great probabilities. The prob probability is that if we will step up and train our child the, in the way they should go, guess what? When they are, are old, they will not depart from God. That is so true. As we see in this world today, a generation falling farther and farther from God. We need more than ever for Christian parents to step up. Now, maybe you're here listening to this message and you have fallen back. Or maybe you've never come to Christ to begin with. You know, it's not too late. It's not too late to step up, step up in parenting, and it's not too late to step up in faith to Jesus Christ. And if you have not received Christ as your Savior, if you've not come to learn that Jesus is the way, 
then today is the day of salvation. The Bible says that. You can come to faith. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for each person listening to this message. I pray that you would instill in them a strong desire to step up. To step up and believe and step up and to parenting and to be the Christian that God, that you, my Lord, want them to be. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Everlasting, your light will shine when all 
else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out of my soul. Cries out from the inside out of my soul. Cries out. Well, we're so excited that you were able to join us today. It's really special when God's people come together and we respond to God. We worship the Lord, we hear from His Word, and then we respond. And I just want to invite you, some of you may have put your faith in Jesus today. And you've heard me say this a bunch of times, putting your faith in Jesus is, is, is part of uh, being, it, you're not an alone ranger, you're not going at this alone, you're part of the church. And we want to invite you to journey with us. Let us know that you put your faith in Jesus by sending us an email at info at victoryanaheim.org. And just send us a quick email letting us know, hey, I put my faith in Jesus today. I want to follow Jesus. And we'll, put, we'll send you out some resources to help you follow Jesus. Because it's the kind of thing that you need to learn how to do. It doesn't come automatic. You need to train to follow Jesus. And then now I want to send you out with a blessing. God's people, you are blessed. As you walk in the ways of Jesus, you live a blessed life. And God wants you to live in the blessing. Not that everything's going to be perfect. Not that you won't have any problems. Not that you won't have opposition. Because you'll have all of those things. But as you go, God is with you. And as you go, you have the joy of the Lord in you. And the joy of the Lord will be your strength, your power as you trust in Him. So be blessed as you walk in the joy of the Lord. And then will you join us once more as, as we sing the song, This is Amazing Grace. sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless and all in wonder the king of glory the king above all amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that I will be set free I sing for all that you've done for 